So my name is Andrew Grace. I'm a cardiologist at Cambridge. I've actually been here since the mid 1980s when I was a, a young doctor as a houseman. And then I did a clinical job. And then I basically started in about the mid 1990s as a honorary consultant initially at Papworth, working in the university, predominantly involved in research. But because my area of interest increased enormously, I moved to an NHS post in the early 2000s and have been in that role really ever since with an honorary position in the university. My area of clinical interest, the area in which I see patients with particular conditions is the area of cardiac arrhythmias. So th this is a disruption of the normal heartbeat. And again, if you go back, say the mid 1990s, there weren't many therapeutic options there. We had drugs, but the drugs were never terribly good. Um, it was always thought rather that these people who looked after people with arrhythmias, it was a very abstract academic interest and of no practical importance or little practical importance in terms of patient management. And that's been transformed over a period of about 15, 20, 25 years, something like that, to now we're extremely, I would say, therapeutically effective. There are areas that are unresolved. The main areas where we have not got resolution is in predicting who's, for example, at risk of dying suddenly, an area of great interest because we now have means of protecting people against the risk of dying suddenly. But so we need to identify the right people to get those rather proactive treatments. So that's been an area of interest of mine for some time, that is identifying people at risk. And another area of interest is developing better therapeutic approaches, because at the moment we use what's called ablation often. This is where we place catheters in the hearts of patients to identify areas that might be causing a disrupted heartbeat, and we cauterize those areas or freeze those areas to remove the cells that might be causing the problem. The issue is we can't apply that to everybody and we need better drugs, but to get better drugs, we need better targets, if you like, that can be identified either through genetics, genomics, or using functional assays. So that's my current area of interest, using um, complex um, biological strategies to identify drug targets. Cardiology is by definition an interventional approach. And you need to be able to do procedural work as well as doing the work where you're speaking to people and seeing people in clinic and doing ward rounds and those sorts of clinical aspects in addition to doing research. The issue is in the community, the community wants high standards. So if, for example, a person doing cardiology is doing procedures on people and then there are issues with those procedures, which there will be always on occasion because procedures are not perfect, then the accusation might be made, and it may not be made explicitly, but rather surreptitiously, that the person is doing too much, you see. So there's always accusations going on in the background that people might be trying not trying to do too much, trying to be a bit too clever. So you've got to be better. You've got to be, you know, be more diligent, if you like, in the pursuit of the practical aspects so those accusations cannot be drawn and you can then carry on. But it, the trouble with that, then it requires many hours of work, and often 60 to 80 hours a week is the sort of you know, time that is required to do multiple different roles, because even just academic medicine of itself is extremely intense and time consuming. You know, I went to medical school, like St. Thomas's Medical School, there were 70 people in the year. And those 70 people actually went on to provide the whole range of what medicine needed in terms of interest. You know, some will do child psychiatry, some will be cardiac surgery, where they'd be doing very different tasks in those things. So you have these different people anyway in medicine fulfilling different roles. And then you have people with different interest in inquiry, to go deeper, to look at mechanism, to think about moving the field forward, whereas many doctors will have an interest in actually applying what's available now and consolidating that. They'll be often quite conservative. They won't necessarily want to integrate new ideas into what they do. So basically, I think if you have a, the academic bent is a particular subset of people, they you know, are intrinsically inquiring, I guess. They want to find out what's going on. And so that's the first step. You know, so the first advice is, are you truly inquiring? And do you realize how much this is going to take? I mean, this is going to be in addition to actually pursuing very high levels of clinical practice because you are going to get comments from outside that you're taking on too much. So you've got to be extremely committed to doing 
a substantial amount of work. So again, when I see people often maybe in their late 20s, early 30s, they say they'll do whatever it takes to do this thing. They then find as they go through their 30s, actually, in particularly in cardiology, actually other pressures come to bear, like um, marriage and children and other pressures. So they got, you know, one has to, from the point of view of advice from people like me, I've got to prepare them for that. that this will be an extremely intense, time-consuming activity. They've got to be interested and committed to it, you know, and have and think about this is a long term venture. So that, to my view, would be best that you would understand the time commitment and you would go for big questions and you would have to be brave and one would have to expect failures en route, if you like, and learn from your failures. So the thing I'm probably most known for is the subcutaneous defibrillator that is now in something like 120,000 people worldwide. Ericsson, the football player who had the cardiac arrest at the beginning of the Euros, has got one of the devices we developed, for example. So, but that process was a process of a 10-year development thing for myself between 2002 and 2012 or thereabouts to get approval. So, And that was with one paper towards the end of that process. We've then gone on more recently to develop a technology to address one of the points I made to you earlier about identifying targets within the heart, both for treatment through ablation, but also to identify biological targets that one can use then to exploit and develop drug therapies. So the technology that we've developed on this occasion as we treat it to fundamental principles, first principles, if you like, in electrostatic field theory, like aspects of physics applied to medicine. And again, what people I think um, in, our, in the field of medicine have tripped over is the importance of physics. They think about biology being so important, but physics underpins much of what we do, whether it's the electrocardiogram, whether it's x-rays, whether it's other forms of imaging. You know, this is all MRI, CT, it's all physics that underpins these things. So I've been working with physicists and engineers to develop this technology. The technology very specifically is uh, an array, if you like, that's placed in the chamber of the heart of an individual. It bounces ultrasound off the wall to generate an internal intracardiac anatomy of the endocardial wall. That's the lining of the surface of the heart. And then it makes measurements from those surfaces without touching the wall, electrical voltage measurements, and then uses um, Poisson formulations that go back to the early part of the 19th century and Maxwellian physics that goes back to the middle of the 19th century to reconstruct anatomical um, and functional um, anatomy of the chamber. Functional in the sense that you can work out activation maps with a one millimeter resolution within the chamber. So this allows you to see exactly where things are happening, where things are coming from, allows one to target therapies effectively, and also one um, generate new hypotheses, if you like, in terms of what causes arrhythmias at all, which is what we're interested in. I think it needs a wider debate. There's something historical that has happened in terms of the development of this whole argument. And that, for example, in interventional specialities, and particularly came about in surgery, the European Work Time Initiative and stuff like that, that limited people's hours. And accordingly, you might rec remember that the surgeons were complaining, surgeons who were not pursuing academic pursuits, that they were not getting sufficient practice in what they did. And again, there's been this pushback in the medical community saying that you do not need to do 40 to 60 hours a week to gain practical clinical experience. I think m most people of my generation think that you actually need to do quite a few hours you know, in order to get that practical experience. You know, we have good data from multiple centers around the world that centers that have high volumes, you know, um, get the best data. There's people like Malcolm Gladwell, the 10,000 hour rule that you need to do things for 10,000 hours to become really good at it. You know, we do know people like myself, who's been putting catheters in the heart of uh, hearts of people since 1988, like, a, you know, 33 years or whatever, that if I take time away from that, I become rusty. You know, so basically it's continuous practice. And the same, I think, is in science, you know, that one needs the continuity there as well. I mean, one of the differences in the UK compared to, for example, the US, I mean, in the US in academic pursuit, oftentimes, I mean, in, in non-cardiology, I mean, in, cardio, in, sorry, in cardiology, in cardiology, they've had time on the wards and time off the wards. And that, again, I don't think has allowed them to develop um, interventional cardiology academics you know so many of the people of my um, group and the people even 10 20 years younger than me 
in cardiology, they, they started out doing pacemakers and catheters and electrophysiology. They've now gone almost purely academic, actually, the successful ones, because actually to keep up the continuous practice that you need in order to refine your skill and evolve your skill. Because one of the things, again, I was thinking earlier that we need to bring into this argument is that things do not remain static. And in the field of arrhythmias, again, they particularly move forward. And you need to be like, in the community, on the ground, hearing this thing move on. But then that allows you to identify the research questions. I mean, the problem is if you're not seeing patients, and again, it's really subtle and very difficult to pin down the exact realities of this, but actually speaking to the people in the clinic, they sort of tell you what they need. You know, they say they get in side effects with X drug. You then think how you're going to get another drug. You don't think it explicitly, but you, that they're leading you to the obvious conclusion that you need to do something different in this area. I think, you know, this constant engagement, um, et cetera, but for sure, you're going to need to do a lot of work, a lot of hours, and you need, going to be, need to be aware that things will come into your life externally that will change that, which will be often young children. There'll be, you know, someone at home like your wife or your partner who needs, you know, wants you to come and participate more in family life and these sorts of things. So, you know, you need to be prepared for that and you need to be prepared for the long journey. I think just moving just as the other a point that was just raised in terms of the size of the question, the problem with taking on a big question and everything staked upon that, and I always think about people who took on a crystallography project in Cambridge, for example. They took a particular molecule. They had to make a crystal of that molecule. It would take them two or three years, possibly, and it might fail. And then they had to take an image of that crystal to get its structure. And, you know, this goes back to Max Perutz and the people who won the structure of, no, you know, structure of hemoglobin that won them the Nobel Prize in 1962. That those people, you know, were on this thing and they, they could be doing something for three or four years and they they sort of knew it might not work, you know? But I think the people who've taken on those problems, in my experience, have you, they've usually make, made it work somehow. You know, that I don't, I can't recall someone, and I'm in the biochemistry department in Cambridge where these big problems have often been taken on. And the people have almost invariably succeeded. You know, maybe not in the exact problem they set out on, but something related that's given them satisfaction. So I think even though in people taking on big questions, on big journeys, there'll be moments of difficulty and disappointment, they can continue and then be successful. My future plans is I'm basically 63 this month in a, a week or so's time. And so, you know, I, I've realized during this lockdown period about not the finiteness of time in some deep philosophical sense, but in terms of addressing the big questions and tidying up my portfolio, if you like, in terms of research. I think to step back from clinical work, I think I'm doing, have been doing until recently 50 hours a week of clinical work and to free up that time now to just drive forward. I think some of the questions we've been involved with, particularly that relate to the physics, some time away from actually seeing patients. And I think I'm now in a position to do that because having been dealing with patients since 1983, work it out yourself, but quite a long time, I've got sufficient storage of knowledge and experience in order to do that. I think there will be a time, I think, you know, one could calculate probably, you know, in people's 50s, they might step back to different roles, you know, and do different, different approaches to their research agendas, if you like. But I think they need to get the, the experience under their belt, if you like, on the clinical sphere in order to allow them to continue in sufficient momentum, if you like, and, and stuff to move forward in regard to the next period of time. So I think I could hopefully could keep this going um, as long as I don't become unwell, you know, into my early 70s. So I think 10 years now of actually we're going to do a, a cell atlas of the human heart and we're going to use our mapping technology and combine it with some patented um, sampling technologies within the heart of patients and then combine that with single cell genomics. So we're going to take samples within the heart and look at the gene, genomic makeup and the, the genes expressed in individual cells in different locations of the heart in order to think about mechanisms and drug targets and, and, and elements like that. The biggest personal impact in a direct sense is, is developing the electrophysiology service in Cambridge. It didn't exist since I started, till I started in 1996. There are now eight full-time consultants. We're one of the biggest services 
We were, were certainly the biggest service in the UK for quite a period of time, one of the biggest in Europe. Some of the things that we have dealt with in the field of electrophysiology, such as the condition called wolf parkinson white syndrome, where people are born with a connection, if you like, in the heart, which can be treated now within half an hour or an hour by placing catheters in the heart, was previously intractable you know, in the 80s. And these poor young people used to suffer really very gravely, and now they can be fixed. Um, so at a personal, you know, direct level, we've had an impact on, on a multitude of lives. I think I've probably seen 20 to 30,000 patients in my specialist field and done 12 to 13,000 procedures. So, you know, that shows, you know, as a direct impact. As a more indirect impact, the, the technology has, has had the most benefit worldwide is the subcutaneous defibrillator that, you know, basically, for example, Ericsson, using him as an example, he has a lead. I do not know it, Ericsson. I just know he's got one of these devices, but I can speak about him generically. That if he'd have had a device of, that is a defibrillator with a lead within the heart, that lead of itself would have carried a risk to him over time. There's no reason now why he shouldn't have a, live a, a normal duration of life because the lead is under the skin. It's unlikely to cause him problems of itself. And the chance of him having another cardiac arrest is pretty low. It's higher than you know, if he'd not had the prior cardiac arrest, if you like, but he will now be protected against further cardiac arrest. He's obviously a fit and a robustly fit person otherwise. So now he should live a normal life. My career has been unplanned. I think if I look now, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting that we're thinking about the mechanisms of the electrocardiogram at the moment that relate to the movement of sodium across cell membranes. And as it happens, I've been working on sodium moving across cell membranes since 1989. Many of my key papers are in this area. But I didn't design it that way. You know, I basically, I could construct a story now that would make it look like Grace was always interested in sodium moving across cell membranes. It wasn't like that. So basically, I think there's not much I've learned to where I, whereby I would have done something differently, if you like. I sound like I'm on a chat show scenario now. It, it's not like I wouldn't have changed anything, but I wouldn't have embarked upon the journey in a different way. I came to it naively. I didn't come from a medical background, so I didn't actually have like a, a parent or someone who'd gone down a career and I'd seen things happen to them that I then thought would I would now do differently, if you like. So I went in this completely naively and entered it and have just carried on on a journey, you know, learning as I've gone along, if you like, learning from my mistakes. I think being strengthened, therefore, by my mistakes and realizing that sometimes things don't work. And then we've moved off those and gone down some other route and but always had something moving forward. I, I think the good thing, actually, about having the joint clinical and academic route is the clinical stuff you know it's a nine to five essentially construct whereby a series of tasks need to be constructed you know dealt with during the day you deal with them and then you, that's them dealt with you move on whereas the research thing is much more free floating and so you've got this combination there for in the clinical academic world an enormous advantage actually you've got this thing that's continuously moving forward that's you know giving you job security as well actually the whereby that can carry on if you keep the expertise up Whereas obviously the clinical, the academic or the more exploratory route, if you like, is much more, you know, full of, there's not full of uncertainties, but uncertainties around the edges, sufficient uncertainty to make it good to have something else that's more certain on the other side.